as a David said. Got it. Um, as David has said, my name is Brendan Hodden and I work with the Dundee Research Interest Group, a group that works very strongly with the University of Dundee. Um, I am a person with Parkinson's. I've diagnosed in 2017 and I'm introducing today's speaker, which I'm absolutely delighted to do. Uh, I've had several contacts with um, Miracle before and um, I, I know him uh, relatively well so uh, through that particular mechanism. Uh, the Edinburgh Parkinson Research Group um, has invited all, all the Scottish Rigs to today's talk by Professor Miratul Mukit from the University of Dundee. Uh, Professor Mukit is of Bangladeshi descent and spent his childhood growing up in industrial towns of Scotland, initially in the former shipyard town of Greenock and later in the former mining town of Schotts in northern Lanarkshire. Um, Miratul is now a Wellcome Trust Senior Clinical Fellow and Group Leader at the MRC Protein Phosphorylation and Ubiquitylation, better known as the PPU unit in, um, in Dundee. His laboratory is focused on understanding mechanisms of neuro neurodegeneration in, Par in Parkinson's disease. He received his medical degree from the University of Edinburgh. He studied neurobiology at Harvard University on a Kennedy Scholarship before receiving his PhD at the UCL Institute of Neurology. He, under, he undertook clinical training um, at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery at Queen Square in London. And he continues to treat patients with Parkinson's disease and related movement disorders at Nine Wilds Medical School Hospital in Dundee. Regarding his research, he played a major role in the discovery of the PINK1 mutations in Parkinson's disease in 2004 and his laboratory has made many related advances since. He has uh, received several awards for his Pink One research, including the Queen Square Prize in Urology in 2006, the Francis Crick Medal and Lecture of the Royal Society in 2018, and he was elected Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh in 2020. The title of Professor Mukat's talk today is Exploring Energy Production and Failure in Parkinson's We'll hear about the critical role that problems in the mitochondria, the part of our cells that produce energy, play in Parkinson's and how Professor Mukit used generic and technical approaches to one, identify defects in the pathways that recycle the damaged mitochondria and investigate new targeted therapies. I'm very much looking forward to today's talk, so I'll waste no more time and pass the word on to Miratul. Please, Miratul. Thank you. Thanks very much, Brendan, and thanks, David, also. And I'd also like to thank the research interest groups across Scotland for asking me to speak today. So I'll just start um, sharing my screen. <clears throat> so before I begin, I thought I would uh, just briefly mention um, that our, my work, my laboratory, uh, my clinical practice now in Dundee is part of a a growing uh, ecosystem that is uh, uh, currently in Dundee with several colleagues now working at the front line uh, of different aspects. So I work very closely with, as many of you may know, Dr. Dario Lessi, who's pioneering uh, another Parkinson's uh, pathway. This is the LRK2 pathway, a very exciting pathway in which there are now clinical trials uh, for inhibitors of this drug. Uh, I have another fantastic colleague, Dr. Samler, Esther Samler, who's a neurologist doing very cutting edge translational uh, work in Parkinson's. She's established some clinical trials for Parkinson's patients for the first time in, in, in many years in Scotland and is currently uh, undertaking a number of trials. And then one of my uh, uh, colleagues at the hospital, Dr. Tom Gilbertson, uh, has started a new program of research using um, high frequency ultrasound to treat uh, movement disorders such as tremor and Parkinson's. And we all work very closely together and we really are trying to uh, bring in Dundee a sort of a multidisciplinary approach to the problem. Um, and, it's, and it's just sort of been uh, great to, to, to uh, be based there. Um, and also I should add that in, in the last few years, I think the interactions that we've had with the Dundee Research Interest Group really also enhance our ecosystem. And certainly we've benefited greatly from discussions. I've obviously, Brendan mentioned, we've spoken uh, several times. 
are and in practical terms, I think what the the, the Dundee Research Interest Group does for us is, 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 is phenomenal. Um, and particularly we've benefited from many students being able to uh, work in my laboratory and also my colleagues, thanks to studentships uh, that the Dundee Research Interest Group have uh, helped fund. So um, I'm now going to uh, begin my talk. And um, what I thought was that I, because I, 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 I would imagine that the audience uh, know a lot about Parkinson's is that I'm, I'm not really going to talk very much about Parkinson's, the, the, the illness itself. I want to really dive straight in to the science that we have been focusing on that's, that's helping us to clarify the origins of how Parkinson's occurs in the brain. And I want to, first of all, take everybody uh, maybe back to school a little bit, just to kind of the, the, the basic sort of uh, uh, machineries in the cell. So this, this I'll just sort of uh, start my pointer. So this is just a very simple schematic of, of a cell. It could be any cell. It could be a brain cell, a heart cell, a muscle cell. And within the cell, you have uh, uh, what's called the nucleus. Within this nucleus, we have uh, DNA. Uh, and then we also have other structures in, in the cell. Uh, and the one that I've been particularly interested in are these structures here, uh, which are called mitochondria. Um, now, we'll, uh, DNA is vital uh, because DNA makes message, messenger uh, RNA, which then is translated into protein. And proteins I, I regard as being like little machines. We have, we have tens, hundreds of thousands of these machines in the cell that are all helping to keep the cell processes active. Uh, and it's, naturally, it's critical that, that the DNA uh, uh, and the production of protein is, is critical for that it's done in a, in a, in a, a way that ensures that it's um, efficient and functioning well. I think that mitochondria <clears throat> also are vital for, for the cell. And the most studied property of these structures, uh, and this is, this is an electron micrograph, so this is a very, very high resolution image of what these mitochondria look like. Um, but the, these are uh, most uh, 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 important for producing energy. Uh, and it does this through production of a chemical called adenosine triphosphate or ATP. Uh, and without, without the energy, you can't, you can't get the proteins being made and you can't get a lot of, you know, most of the cell processes performed. So, so these, these, these sort of uh, 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 pathways are very, very important. Now, as I've said, mitochondria, they, they may make energy. They're sort of like the power stations of our cell and they require fuel and they get the fuel from uh, extrinsic sort of uh, uh, mechanisms. So in our diet, uh, we, we take in calories and, and this is ultimately uh, uh, sorted in cells to, to, in the mitochondria to provide, provide energy. And we also need <coughs> oxygen as well. Now, uh, it's, on, on, it's also the case that that we can uh, experience damage to these uh, mitochondrial structures in the way that man-made power stations can become damaged. Um, they can uh, either stop producing energy or they start producing bad energy. You know, so, so it's actually critical that the cell can detect this and ensure that the production of energy is seamless. So this brings me to a very important concept in our work, which is that the fact that our cells in the body, every cell is being exposed to damage uh, um, constantly. Um, the best example to think about, I think, is, is, is with regard to DNA damage. So our, if you, you know, uh, as many of you will know, if you uh, expose yourself to the sun uh, too much, your skin cells are they, they're exposed to very high amounts of ultraviolet radiation, which ultimately is damaging DNA. Um, but, but not everybody that uh, is having sun tans and uh, sunning themselves will get cancer. Some do, uh, many don't. 
Uh, but uh, it's very, very, very uh, pressing to appreciate that, that damage is happening all the time. And similarly, uh, 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 in terms of DNA damage, it's been very well studied, it's not just not just ultraviolet, but also carcinogens in terms of what you eat, what you're exposed to, uh, and also within the cell, inside the cell, there are uh, molecules that are produced that are damaging the DNA. Ultimately, if that goes unchecked, that can lead to diseases such as cancer. And similarly, mitochondrial uh, structures are also being exposed to damage uh, from all sorts of ways. And this is linked ultimately to the development of, of a number of diseases, including brain diseases, and also is thought to contribute to aging. So if we go back to, to DNA damage, and I mentioned, so why is it that not everyone, uh, is, why is it that we're not all, if, if we're saying that in every sort of millisecond of our lives we're being exposed to DNA damage, but we don't get cancer, the reason for that is that the cell has evolved to have very, very elaborate and precise uh, damage repair pathways. So for, for as, we, as you and I are sitting here, there are many, many molecules in the cell that are acting at the, at the DNA to repair all the damage that's occurring. And it's, 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 an, it's an incredible uh, or, um, uh, process, but it essentially sure ensures that we don't develop diseases from DNA damage. And, but it turns out there are unfortunately individuals who, who may have genetic perturbations, they're, they're born with heritable mutations in some of these uh, uh, proteins and components that are important for DNA damage, and they are they will be at higher risk of cancer. So if we go back now to the D, the mitochondria, we know far less about these repair pathways. We know that they exist, but when I started my work, these were very very uh, little understood. Uh, whereas with the DNA damage, we understand these incredibly well to the point now that we have many treatments for cancer based on this uh, that can not only, so we know how to prevent, but also treat cancer based on knowledge of DNA repair pathways. So the idea uh, is if we can understand repair pathways, that could lead to new insights, uh, not just knowledge, but also potentially application and disease treatment. So <clears throat> it turns out for brain, for brain diseases, and obviously, you, uh, there, are, there are many different types. Um, Parkinson's turns out to be uh, a very, very critical, uh, crit to be critically linked to mitochondrial damage. Um, and it's been shown uh, particularly by studying brains of patients who have passed away from Parkinson's, that if you look at the structures of the brain that are affected in Parkinson's, there's a lot of damaged DNA, so damaged mitochondria in, in the brain. Um, and why is that? So the brain cells that are particularly vulnerable in Parkinson's are the dopamine cells within the structures of the substantia nigra. This is an image from a mouse brain, but I think it's equally uh, applicable to the human brain. But what I want to illustrate is that each of our dopamine brain cells projects to uh, another part of the brain called striatum. And one cell can connect with many, many thousands of cell, other brain cells within the striatum. So you can imagine that this is going to require lots of energy, and in fact, it does. So the fact that these brain cells are aligned to so much energy makes them implicitly uh, vulnerable to damage to, to mitochondria. And it turns out that, that our mitochondrial, mitochondria can be damaged in a number of ways. So, we can be exposed to toxins, and there have been some examples uh, of humans being exposed to toxins, so some man-made toxins, such as a chemical back in the early 80s called NPTP, which can damage mitochondria. Also, um, uh, occupations such as mining, uh, if you mine a manganese and expose yourself to manganese, not something that we see much in the West now, but certainly still a problem in, say, parts of India, uh, where health and safety isn't as good. Uh, manganese is, is highly toxic and damaging to your mitochondria. And then you can also uh, uh, have, uh, you've made in the, in the previous times, 
many agricultural uh, treatments use uh, chemicals that can damage mitochondria. And then you can also be born with uh, mutations in the mitochondrial DNA itself. So, so there's many, many uh, uh, different uh, inputs into damaging the mitochondria. And these, have all, and these are all been shown to ultimately lead to less energy being produced and, 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 and the development of Parkinson's in, in, in patients. Um, and so we, knew, we, we know these links, but what we didn't have really was a clear cut pathway to, to, to explain this. Uh, and, and, and the components of the pathway also were, were unknown. I thought that uh, <clears throat> Brendan gave an introduction to my uh, uh, background, but something I, I want to share with you all is that, you know, I think when you do research, you have to have uh, uh, a sort of passion and interest in it because it's, it's not, you know, a straightforward process. There's lots of ups and downs. You need, you need to have, I think, grit and determination. And the, 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 the reason I got interested in Parkinson's and, and particularly mitochondrial uh, uh, met pathways was uh, work from this. Um, unfortunately, he just passed away last year. But this professor who was who was at uh, uh, first at Harvard, but then at Cornell, Flint Beale, and he he studied in, in the 1980s and 90s. He was one of the pioneers of showing that mitochondrial damage was linked to Parkinson's, and he actually was one of the first people I, I did lab projects with, um, and I worked and I was very much influenced by him by his. Um, his uh, work, and also he was a great, great mentor to me. But he was one of the, the, the early proponents that, that mitochondrial damage is linked to, to brain diseases. But, uh, but, how, but, but, but how, how, do you, how do you get into this in terms of pathway understanding? So I would regard Parkinson's, you might've seen this image in other talks from others, but as, as like an iceberg. I mean, for most people with Parkinson's who have what we call sporadic Parkinson's. We know associations, we know links, but we actually, that hasn't really led us to sort of crystal clear uh, uh, insights into the mechanism. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I see that sort of being this sort of beneath the, beneath the iceberg. But, but what we do see <clears throat> at the top is that in a few patients who have heritable Parkinson's due to a genetic cause, that has provided a way for researchers like myself to make some traction into the problem. And, uh, and, and in the work that I'm going to tell you about, the, the breakthrough that has really aided us was um, work that I did during my PhD with my supervisor, Nick Wood, in which we identified a mutation in a gene called PINK1 back in 2004. And this was work, the gene itself was discovered by, by a colleague, Patrick Slyman, and I did some of the early characterization. But this for us really opened up a new avenue of investigation. And the reason why PINK1 turned out to be very interesting as a gene was that this is the structure of PINK1. And this is our, our, all genes make proteins. And within each of these uh, our proteins, there are different parts to it that have different, different roles. But the, the, there is one part of PINK1 which is very interesting because it actually attaches pink one to these mitochondrial structures. So it was actually the first Parkinson's gene to be directly linked to mitochondria, which, which gave us sort of very direct evidence that these mitochondria were very important for Parkinson's. It also had another bit to it, which I'm gonna call here the enzyme domain. And it turned out a lot of the the mutations that patients inherited were within this enzyme domain. So this was telling us that, that the enzyme function of pink one was somehow perturbed and that was causing disease. But this link to the mitochondria was actually very fascinating to me. Uh, uh, and uh, again, what, what really motivated me to, to follow this work up. So just to highlight that, we can, we can actually label mitochondria in cells. And this is from the original paper, this was work that I originally did, but you can take a cell and you could add a dye and the dye is only taken up by these mitochondrial structures. And you can see that here in this red signal. And then we can label pink one and see where that is in the cell. 
And you can see here that when, when I did that, it had a very, very similar pattern to the mitochondria. And that sort of confirmed experimentally that this was indeed in, in these structures. So, <clears throat> but, but as I've mentioned, the, the, the mutations were happening in the enzyme domain. So uh, what is, what is uh, uh, this enzyme that uh, PINK1 works as? So it turns out it's a, it's a very common class of enzyme in cells called kinases, protein kinases. And I just wanted to show this little uh, graphic here, if it, if it works here for me, let's see if it's going to work. So all proteins uh, can be targeted by these kinase enzymes and they attach uh, a chemical uh, phosphate, uh, which it gets from this molecule ATP that I've mentioned that provides energy. And it turns out if a protein is attached with phosphate, that can change the function of the protein in very dramatic ways. It can change where the protein is, it can change the lifetime of the protein, and it can also change its activity if the protein is an enzyme. So they're very, very important. And they have many functions in the cell. It's not just in mitochondria, but they're important for growth, for cell division, uh, uh, and, uh, we, and there are about 500 different ones. But the question that I was interested in was really, what was the function of the PINK1 enzyme? And that's what uh, drew me to moving to Dundee because at Dundee, uh, since 1990, they've had this cent World Center of Excellence in Protein Phosphorylation that's funded by the Medical Research Council that studies these enzymes. And I decided that this was the best place for me to be to explore the function of PINK1. And my question really was, what's the function of PINK1? And if we understand that, then we might be able to understand how the mutations cause Parkinson's, which would be the first start potentially to thinking about how to better treat Parkinson's. And what we found, and I'm gonna show this in a series of graphics is, um, it turns out what we find is that PINK1 is a sensor in the cell for mitochondrial damage. So it turns out that if your mitochondria are healthy and making lots of ATP and doing that in a very, very orderly way, then it turns out that the pink one pathway is not active. The, key, the cell is not interested in using pink one. It doesn't need it because the mitochondria are healthy and the cell is not under any risk or threat. But what our work and others found was that if you damage mitochondria, and we can do this in the cell in a number of ways, we can add chemicals, for example, that can damage it. Then we found that this was a very powerful trigger to activate the pink pathway. And um, in, the, in the laboratory, when we, find, when we found this, it was a very dramatic uh, finding because it took something that we couldn't detect any uh, our activity on. And then we saw this very, very tremendous uh, activation. And uh, this then allowed us to study what PINK1 does. And what our main findings were was, I mentioned that these enzymes like kinases have to attach phosphates to proteins. And we uh, found those proteins. And it turns out one of them was another Parkinson's protein called Parkin. This is also mutated in patients. And uh, we found a very, well, one, we had found one place in Parkin in which the phosphate was added. And Parkin has uh, a region of it, which is called uh, a ubiquitin uh, domain. And it turns out that this was also true of, of, of this ubiquitin, uh, even if it's not part of Parkin. So there's a lot of, free ubiquitin in, in cells and in brain cells. And it turned out the pink one can also attach phosphates to this. So our work actually shed light on the, on the sort of this, 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 this pathway in terms of the targets. 
But why, why that was really important comes back to what I said earlier, which was that this damage to the mitochondria is a threat to the cell. Now, if you're a skin cell or a heart cell uh, or a cell in the lining of the lung or, the, or, the, or, the, or your gut, this probably isn't so, so much of a threat because those cells renew, they all divide. So if there is damaged cells, the body naturally sort of is constantly recycling its pool of cells by cell division and making new cells. But the brain, the, the, the brain cells and the neurons in particular don't divide. A brain cell has to stay with us for as long as we live. So damage to the mitochondria is actually a much bigger threat um, in the body than any other, other place. So the work that we did in terms of understanding the function linked in very, very well with observations made by another researcher, and this is Richard Yule at the National Institutes of Health, who was able to show that the pathway when it's active, when pink one is active and, and, and targets Parkin, this leads to the elimination of that damaged mitochondria. So here you have a damaged mitochondria and here you have a healthy mitochondria. But when this Parkin pathway is switched on, the damaged mitochondria is completely removed. This, the, the brain cell does not want that because this damaged mitochondria is producing lots of uh, bad toxins, lots of bad chemicals, which could potentially uh, poison the rest of the cell and, 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 and cause it to die early. And, and so our findings uh, contributed to this uh, cell biological observation of Richard Yule that the actual damaged mitochondria is, is eliminated. But where our work uh, provided a key explanation was that if you are a patient that has a mutation in the pink one gene or the Parkin gene, then the pathway doesn't switch on. And so what you get is then you fail to remove these damaged mitochondria. And so now the brain cell is exposed to these pollutants from the damaged mitochondria. And that is what we think ultimately would lead to Parkinson's. Now, <clears throat> many of our findings and those of others have been done in very basic uh, systems. So in science, uh, going straight to the brain, for example, was not possible for this problem because the brain's very complex, has many, many processes. Um, so you have to reduce your system down. And so, so many of our critical findings were achieved in bacterial cells and also in, in, in sort of very simple cells that we grow in a dish. And, and, but once we knew, so once we'd found uh, what I would got kind of almost an, as an analogy, the needles in the haystack, we were able to then go back and say, well, is this really true in, in more complex systems? And in our laboratory, the systems that we use are, we, we use mice. We can also t uh, grow brain cells from mice in a dish. And then we also have patients that we can study as well. And I wanted to show you how we've taken the knowledge from the uh, very basic systems that we use and shown that it's actually relevant to Parkinson's. So some, some people here in the audience may have had this test, it's called a DAT scan. This is a test in which you can tell in a living person if they have Parkinson's or not. You, you get injected with a radioactive isotope. And if, it's if you have uh, sort of a normal number of dopamine cells, this is sort of the pattern that you see. But if you have Parkinson's, you can see that you get a loss of this. So it's quite, an, a, quite, a, very, it's quite a useful test for us. And it's, not, it's not what I would say doesn't substitute for the clinical examination and it's not needed for every patient. It's usually in my, in my practice, I only use this where somebody may be borderline, I'm not sure if they have Parkinson's or not, but it's very, it's a very, very useful test. Why I'm showing you this is it turned out to be very useful in a clinical study because one of the key findings from our work, which really linked to what I've told you so far has been very much about basic biology, 
But one of the key dis uh, kind of discoveries that we made was, was, was proving that this pathway is relevant to Parkinson's. And how we did that was we searched for patients all over the world that had mutate, sort of mutations in some of these key uh, 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 signaling uh, nodes that we'd uncovered. And what we did, what we found was uh, that we had colleagues in Finland who had been sequencing uh, patients with Parkinson's and they found uh, a Finnish gentleman who was born with a uh, mutation in Parkin. So this is the target of pink at a very specific place. And this mutation is, would be predicted not to allow pink one to switch it on in the face of any mitochondrial damage. So when we saw that in the patient, we had to go back and then prove that this was really, that he really had Parkinson's. So our colleagues in Finland, although at the time of his diagnosis, he didn't have the, the, this, that scan, we were able to, at the University of Helsinki, he very kindly volunteered to have this test. And this shows you very clearly that he was carrying this mutation and he very clearly has objective evidence for Parkinson's changes in the brain. He also has, uh, uh, his characteristics are also quite typical of the patients that we see with Parkin and Pink, in that he has very early age of onset. So he developed Parkinson's at the age of 38. And we also see in patients with Pink and Parkin that they generally can respond to the medications for longer. So he was in his 60s when we published our work, but was still responding to, to dopamine. But this was actually very, very important in. And, and I, I would say it's actually one of our key findings in, in showing that the cell biology and all of the basic biology that we've done in Dundee is relevant to, to, to patients. So this is just really uh, a little uh, graphic of what we have found. And so when we started this work, we didn't, not just in, in terms of the pink Parkinson's link, but in in just general biology, we didn't actually know in cells that this pathway existed as a, as a defense against damage. But our work and that of others has led to this new, uh, new knowledge. And I'll just, uh, hopefully the video is going to work. So this is a healthy mitochondria and there's no pink, but when the mitochondria is damaged, we found that pink one accumulates on the edge of the mitochondria, it targets Parkin and also this ubiquitin molecule that I mentioned. This then leads to uh, uh, a chains of, of these proteins that brings in more Parkin to the edge of the mitochondria. And then this is sort of what we call a feed forward. So you can see that it's happening again and again. This then brings machinery, which, is, which then leads to the swallowing up and removal of the damaged mitochondria. And this is what we think is happening in our brain cells as, as, in, in, as we are you know, uh, here today. And if we don't have this pathway, we are uh, prone to Parkinson's. So I think our work has actually of all the Parkinson's genes, I think we have actually some of the best understanding about the normal function of, the, of, 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 a, of a Parkinson's gene through studying uh, pink, pink and Park, and through both our, our own work and that of others in, 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 in the field. Now, what does that mean in terms of application and treatments? Well, what it what suggests is that we, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, this is now being uh, uh, done in, in, in the pharma industry, is that we believe that that if you were to develop drugs that can switch on these enzymes, then these would be potentially new therapeutics for treating Parkinson's. And so there is now a number of companies, I should actually declare a conflict of interest because I'm on the advisory board of one company in San Francisco that has a molecule in development. Uh, but there are now companies that have developed molecules which can activate this pink one enzyme still very preclinical, so it's not yet at the level of a clinical trial, but, but this is work that's sort of proceeding. And 
Similarly, there are molecules now, there was a paper published recently by a very big pharma company based in Boston Biogen of a molecule that can activate Parkin. Now, it's actually very hard to, to, to develop these types of molecules. So I mentioned the work of my colleague, Dario Lessi and Dundee, who works on the LK2 pathway. His molecule needs to be inhibited to be beneficial for patients. And companies find it much easier to develop drugs that inhibit rather than activate. So it's a lot more challenging in terms of, uh, in terms of translating this work uh, to, to drugs. But nevertheless, there are some companies that are attempting to do this and actually making, making progress. So, so understanding of our path of this pathway has having impact in terms of drug discovery. And then we also, in collaboration with uh, charities, including the Michael J. Fox Foundation, have been trying to improve uh, chemical tools to detect these processes that I've described in cells as a potential biomarker. And we have had a number of uh, uh, antibodies. Uh, these are, uh, and we all probably know about antibodies through COVID now, but uh, uh, antibodies are uh, able to detect signatures on proteins. And we've developed a number for the pink pathway, and we're hoping that we can exploit this for um, uh, better diagnostic tools uh, for Parkinson's patients. So that's going to bring me to the end of the talk. And so this doesn't just, it's not sort of like a one man band. What our research relies on are young, enthusiastic, motivated and fun people to, to work in your lab. And I've been very lucky to have had many uh, in my time. Um, I should actually say that uh, Brendan, who introduced me, I had a fantastic uh, uh, experience last summer because Brendan's daughter, Brianna, uh, did a project in my lab, which was actually interesting because it was trying to link our molecular work with, with a potential mutation in a patient. Um, and uh, and so, so for me, it's very important uh, that we have, you know, these young people, and I won't really list them by names, but, but uh, um, it's very important for me to do the research that we have young people uh, working on this problem. And then I'm also grateful to all the funding bodies that, that fund my work, uh, and particularly the Wellcome Trust that provide me with personal support for the last sort of approaching 15 years. And I'd also mentioned that Dundee now is part of a very exciting new research network funded by this organization called Aligning Science Across Parkinson's or ASAP. And this is a, a new network which brings together teams from all over the world to work on Parkinson's. And Dundee's only one of uh, four, uh, three universities in the UK that are part of this, this network. And with that, I'm, I'm happy to finish. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks again to David, uh, Brendan and, and the organizers for inviting me to speak.